Beauty. See you a week later. During the past years, Dennis has indeed amassed a very impressive record in cardiovascular physiology research. And his book, The Music of Life, as you may be aware, is the first popular science book on principles of systems biology which has been translated into many languages. Today, Dr. Dennis Novel will give us a lecture about the physiology and the evolution. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Dennis Novel. Ni hao. And Professor Wang, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Xie Xie. I've chosen this morning to talk to you about the way in which physiology can be reintegrated with one of the mainstreams of biology, that is, the theory of evolution, because I believe that one of the major changes in the conceptual foundations of biology are occurring in the field of evolutionary biology. Moreover, those changes are occurring in a direction that will enable physiology to become more relevant. Just a little bit of brief history though. If you go back about 200 years to Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, the French biologist who published the Zoologie Philosophique, he established the transformation of species. It's also well known that he assumed in his work that there could be the inheritance of acquired characteristics and for that reason that process is sometimes called Lamarckism. But he didn't invent the idea. Um, he assumed it, as others did too, uh, from time immemorial, and in particular, Charles Darwin, who 50 years later published The Origin of Species and proposed the theory of natural selection. Um, he also assumed the existence of inheritance of acquired characteristics. The significance of this will become later in the lecture. And then around 1900, there was the integration of Mendelian inheritance, that is discrete inheritance, with evolutionary theory. And about the same time too, um, Weismann established what was called the Weismann barrier, the idea that the germ cells and their genetic material is not in any way influenced by the organism itself or by the environment. And then, something like 40 years later, a variety of people, Julian Huxley, R. A. Fisher, Haldane and Wright, uh, put things together to call it the modern synthesis. So what exactly is the modern synthesis? It's sometimes called neo-Darwinism, and it was popularized in the book by Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, in 1976. Its main assumptions are, first of all, that it is a gene-centered view of natural selection. The process of evolution, therefore, can be characterized entirely by what is happening to the genome. It would be a process in which there would be accumulation of random mutations followed by selection. Now, important point to make here is if that process is genuinely random, then there is nothing that physiology, there's nothing that people like you and me can say about that process. That's a very important point. The second aspect of neo-Darwinism was the impossibility of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. It was miscalled Lamarckism. As I said earlier on, Lamarck did not invent the idea. He assumed it. And there is... A very important distinction, particularly in Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, between the replicator, that is the genes, 
and the vehicle that carries the replicator, that is the organism or phenotype. And of course, that idea was not only buttressed and supported by the Weissmann barrier idea, but also later on by the central dogma of molecular biology. All of these rules have been broken. And that is the subject of my lecture. First of all, are mutations random? Very important book to catch up with what is happening very rapidly in the field of evolutionary biology is the book by the Chicago biochemist um, James Shapiro, Evolution of You from the 21st Century. He writes and he gives detailed evidence. He has thousands of references on this in um, his website. It is difficult, if not impossible, to find a genome change operator that is truly random in its action within the DNA of the cell. All careful studies of mutagenesis find statistically significant non-random patterns of change. In other words, there are hot spots in the genome. Moreover, as we will see later on, the frequency with which those changes can occur can respond to what the organism is doing and what its environment is doing. Just to give one example, p-element homing in fruit flies these are DNA transposons that can insert into the genome in a functionally significant way. And what has been shown is that they do so with a frequency that is 50% greater in regions of the genome that are related functionally. We don't at the moment understand that, but one possibility is that it depends upon the organization of the genome, the way the DNA is folded and the way in which it is structured uh, <coughs> around um, its proteins. Moreover, not only is it the case that mutations are not random, another major assumption of the modern synthesis is incorrect. And we found that out at the time of the sequencing of the human genome in the year 2000, because the nature report of that sequencing showed that two major groups of proteins, the transcription factors and the chromatin binding proteins, do not show gradual change between species um, of the sequence of the proteins, but major domains switching into one protein after another. This is from the report, the 2001 report of the sequencing of the genome, showing domain accretion in yeast, in a worm, a fly, vertebrates, and human. And the stars indicate, that's all you need to take home from this slide, the domains that have shifted around as whole domains, not gradual mutation, one amino acid after another. And as you can see, there are many of them. The same is true for transcription proteins. So my first conclusion is this. Not only is mutation not random, that was one of the essential assumptions of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, uh, but proteins, at least some of them, did not evolve via gradual accumulation of mutations. So let's return to the popularization of neo-Darwinism, which is the book The Selfish Gene. Is it metaphor or is it empirical science? In reply to a philosopher, Mary Mitchley, who wrote a review, a very critical review of The Selfish Gene back in 1979, you remember the book was published in 1976, um, he replied to Mary Midgley that it wasn't a metaphor at all. I believe it is the literal truth, he wrote, provided certain key words are defined in the particular way favored by biologists. Now, if you haven't understood that statement, I want to teach you what a metaphor is. A metaphor is precisely key words defined in particular ways where you change the meaning of the word. What happened there is that I'm sorry to say that a very distinguished scientist, because Richard certainly is that, and a very, very good writer too, um, didn't understand what a metaphor actually meant. For those of you who want to follow up these philosophical and linguistic points in greater detail, the article that I published last year in the Journal of Physiology goes through this point in much more detail than I can do in a general lecture. The point is very simple. A metaphor does not cease to be a metaphor simply because one defines a word to mean something other than its normal meaning. Indeed, it's the function of metaphor to do precisely this. 
So let's do a little experiment. This is an experiment on you. I'm going to compare the two possible metaphors here, genes as prisoners versus selfish genes, or genes as cooperators, if you like, rather than selfish genes. It doesn't really matter. The question I'm going to put to you, as I put two texts up, is what conceivable biological experiment could distinguish between the two groups of metaphors. So let's take the selfish gene metaphor. He wrote, it's beautiful language, I have to say. Uh, Richard has an ability to write that is admirable. Now they, genes, swarm in huge colonies, safe inside gigantic lumbering robots, that's you and me of course, sealed off from the outside world. That is the Weissmann barrier, that is the central dogma of molecular biology. Communicating with it by tortuous indirect routes, manipulating it by remote control. That's the gene-centric view. They are in you and me. That's the only statement that is empirical. They created us body and mind and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. And in case you didn't understand the selfish gene, he went on to write in the extended phenotype that readers should imbibe the fundamental truth that an organism is a tool of DNA rather than the other way around. Now my experiment is very simple. I'm going to turn each one of those statements upside down. State is opposite. Remember, the experiment is what biological experiment could conceivably distinguish between the two. So let's have a look at genes as prisoners. Now they are trapped in huge colonies. Locked inside highly intelligent beings. That's you and me, I think. Moulded by the outside world. I have reversed the idea of isolating the genome. It is not isolated. We'll come on to the evidence for that a little bit later. Communicating with it by complex processes through which blindly, as if by magic, function emerges. They are in you and me. That's the only statement I have not changed because it happens to be correct. We are the system that allows their code to be read and their preservation is totally dependent on the joy we experience in reproducing ourselves. And Incidentally, it's our joy, not theirs. And we are the ultimate rationale for their existence. And If you wish to reverse the statement in the um, extended phenotype, the fundamental truth is that an organism is the only tool by which DNA can express functionality, by which the book of life, if you like that metaphor, can be read. DNA alone is inert, dead. If I took the DNA out of a cell and I put it in a petri dish with as many nutrients as you like, I could keep it for 10,000 years, it would do absolutely nothing. The cell from which I took it would continue to function physiologically perfectly well until it needs to make more proteins. And that's not a thought experiment because it's happening in your body and mine now. Our red cells are exactly like that. So, major conclusion is that a central idea, a central popularization of the modern synthesis is not even falsifiable because I doubt whether anybody in the audience has thought of a biological experiment that could be formed to distinguish between those two metaphorical views of genes. The point, of course, is obvious. It is that selfishness can't be defined as an intrinsic property of nucleotide sequences independently of the gene frequency, which is the only prediction uh, that the hypothesis can make. So, coming back to the question of uh, randomness of mutations, we've seen that they're not random, and gradual accumulation of mutations, we've seen that they are not, at least in the case of certain important proteins. Another thing to add to this is that, so far, it has not been shown that that process could, in any case, give rise to a new species. Notice that thousands of years of domestic selection has produced new varieties of dogs, of fish, and whatever, but not of new species. So, my main conclusion here is that the concept of selfishness applied to genes is simply not testable, and now it raises a very big question. Why was it ever thought to be an empirical fact? I think the reason is that the concept of a gene has changed, and it's changed fundamentally during the century from which well, when Johansson introduced it in 1909 is when it was defined. And this diagram, taken from a recent article that I published with Peter Cole and two or three others, shows the nature of the problem. There is the direct arrow from DNA to phenotype, which was the original idea. 
for each phenotype there was a gene, the gene for this, the gene for that. That is obviously wrong. We know as physiologists that what happens is that large numbers of proteins and other components in cells cooperate in networks, the biological networks, the signaling pathways, the various incubators that enable and, and restrict reactions to enable it to be possible for DNA, which is used as a template to make those proteins, of course, to interact with the environment to produce the phenotype. And if we uh, look at the definitions here, the original definition of a gene, when introduced by Johansson, was that it was the cause of the phenotype. We now realize, of course, that by defining a gene as a sequence of DNA, that has to be filtered through the physiological and biochemical networks. So it is no longer the case that it is the cause of a phenotype. It has to be shown to be a cause and in interaction with, in cooperation with many other components. Moreover, simply by knocking genes out, we don't necessarily reveal function because the network may buffer what is happening. So you may need to do two knockouts or even three before you finally get through to the phenotype. And the reason is obvious to people like us as physiologists. If one network doesn't succeed in producing um, a particular component necessary to the functioning of the cell and the organism, then another network is used instead. So most knockouts and mutations are buffered by the network. So let's take some examples. I'm first going to take an example from my own work showing a gene knockout experiment on a model of the sinus node in which the lowest component there, the protein called IBNA, it's a sodium channel protein, contributing about 80% of the electric current that generates the rhythm, is slowly being knocked down 20, 40, 60, 80, and eventually complete knockout. And you might expect, since it contributes such a large fraction of the electric current to the pacemaker depolarization, that there would be a huge change of frequency. And it's very clear that there isn't. And what is happening, of course, is the other mechanism, labeled IF, is kicking in. Moreover, the model tells us, and it's very, very strongly based on experiments, it tells us the mechanism. Because if I draw a line under those voltage changes, you'll notice that what happens as I knock one component out is that the electrical potential goes into a more negative range of potentials at which it activates the mechanism that is kicking in. This is a beautiful fail-safe mechanism. And of course, a physiological function as important as the pacemaker rhythm of the heart is backed up several times and is fail-safe. If we did this as a knockout experiment in a real animal, we would come to the conclusion that it contributes only about 10% to the frequency. It's actually about 80%. And even for non-quantitative physiologists, that is too much of a difference. Um, another example from my own work was recently looking at targeted knockout of sodium calcium exchange in the heart where, now I should explain, that sodium calcium exchange is the major mechanism by which uh, calcium efflux occurs during electrical activity in the heart. 90% of the calcium fluxing out of the heart is generated by, that flux is generated by the sodium calcium exchange. But as you can see in a mouse, the action potential at the top hardly changes at all when you knock it out. And the reason is, of course, again, that other mechanisms are kicking in. So is this, as it were, an unusual result, a result that Dennis Noble gets in his models of the heart or his experiments on the heart, or is it general? This study went through all 6,000 genes in the organism yeast, knocking them out one by one. Eighty percent of the knockouts are silent. So this physiological process of buffering against gene change is general. It's usual, in fact. Now, that doesn't mean to say that these proteins that are made as a consequence of the gene templates for them don't have a function. Of course they do. If you stress the organism, you can reveal the function. 
Again, it is that if the organism cannot make product X by mechanism A, it makes it by mechanism B. And for those who want to read uh, more on this particular aspect of my lecture, Davies' article in Bioessays is highly recommended. Knockouts do not reveal regulators, and often they don't even reveal function. So what's the origin of the problem? The problem, of course, comes from seeing biology too much from a reductionist point of view. Uh, going from genes to proteins, that arrow, of course, is an unusual one. It's a template, a coding step, and then the various formations of pathways from proteins to subcellular structures, cellular, and all the way up to the organism. And it led, of course, to Richard's statement in the uh, selfish gene, they, genes, created as body and mind. I don't think that's true at all. Um, in fact, I much prefer the statement by the Nobel Prize winner, Sidney Brenner. I know one approach that will fail, which is to start with genes, make proteins from them, and try to build things bottom up. And we know the reason, of course, as physiologists, it is that there is an amazing degree of complexity to be taken into account in addition to the reductionist uh, causation. That is there, of course, and we need the reductionist analysis. Don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing the process and the science of reductionism, but what we have to take into account is that there are many processes of causation from higher levels, with systems level triggering cell signaling, various systems level controls of gene expression, so I've reversed that bottom arrow there's one of the breaks with the central dogma of molecular biology, or at least the way it has been interpreted, because it's protein machinery, after all, that reads genes, and there is, of course, epigenetic marking by all levels. So one of the principles of systems biology that I outlined in the book that you kindly referred to, Chairman, um, is that the transmission of information is simply not one way. I would argue that the central dogma of molecular biology um, has been very badly misinterpreted. Moreover, some of the key writers on the modern synthesis, including John Maynard Smith, have realized that. Even as long ago as 1998, uh, John Maynard Smith, himself a great contributor to neo-Darwinism, wrote that Lamarckism, that is the inheritance of acquired characteristics, is not so obviously false as is sometimes made out. And the next principle is that DNA is not the sole transmitter of inheritance. I don't know why we ever got into thinking that it might be so, because we all, after all, inherit a complete egg cell as well as the DNA. We will see the significance of that in one of the experiments I will refer to a little bit later. We should, therefore, invert the usual question. It should not be, why is it that the inheritance of acquired characteristics is forbidden? It's what prevents it from happening under many circumstances. Well, the answer is that, to some extent, it's not prevented. Paper after paper now is showing the inheritance of epigenetic information. This work by Weaver and his colleagues in Canada showing that even a behavioral characteristic, in this case stroking behavior in rats, can mark the genome in the hippocampus in a way that predisposes the animals to precisely that behavior. And if you think about that, it doesn't matter whether that goes down through the DNA or not because the behavior inserts that particular characteristic in each generation. Anwe and his colleagues with endocrine disruptors showing epigenetic transgenerational uh, transmission of disease. Uh, another article uh, dealing also with male line transgenerational responses in humans. An important study that I'm going to say more about because it was done here in China um, on cross-species cloning and an extremely important study uh, by Richavi and his colleagues in Cell uh, working in Columbia University. Just to refer briefly to some of those, this is the experiments of Weaver and his colleagues. It was reported in a rather amusing uh, article in the Guardian, a national newspaper in Britain, called Motherly Love May Alter Genes for the Better. Of course, what it means is that stroking behavior, the motherly love, is what marks the genome. The great achievement of Weaver and his colleagues was to demonstrate the molecular biological 
process by which the relevant genes in the hippocampus are marked. Um, these are the um, articles that I referred to on endocrine disruptors. Four generations were followed in relation to the transmission of inheritance in that case. And there's an article there um, from India uh, showing, in fact, is the first demonstration of spermatogenic inheritance of an adult-induced characteristic. So my third conclusion is that environmentally induced changes can be inherited. So the question is, what happens in cross-species clones? Cross-species clones would be very interesting if they worked. Because after all, if you put the DNA of one species into the egg cell of another, you should get the animal from which the DNA came. Full stop. That is the, that's the modern synthesis. So let's see what happens. This is a beautiful set of experiments um, done in Wuhan at the Fish Institute here in China by Sun and his colleagues. They took a carp, that's the middle animal there, and a goldfish. They took the nucleus of the carp and they put it into the fertilized but enucleated egg cell of the goldfish. And what you get is an animal that is in, in between. You don't get just a carp. The details are very interesting. Um, the goldfish has about 26 vertebrae in its vertebral column. The carp has about 33. You can therefore think of the goldfish from the point of view of its vertebral column as a kind of scrunched up, um, uh, as, as it was a zipped up carp. What happens when you put the carp nucleus into the goldfish egg is that you get a number of vertebrae that's closer to the goldfish than to the carp. And indeed, the article as a title refers to the cytoplasmic impact on cross-genus clone fish derived from transgenic common carp nuclei and goldfish enucleated eggs. Incidentally, most cross-species clones don't work. This is an unusual result because it does produce an adult at least. In most cases, of course, what we know happens is that the embryo develops up to maybe the eight cell stage, maybe to gastrulation, but then it freezes. There is clearly an incompatibility between the DNA in one species and the egg cell uh, of another that enables the system, as it were, to freeze up rather than to go all the way through. Barbara McClintock the Nobel Prize winner way back in 1983. Incidentally, she got the Nobel Prize when she was very old. I think she was about 83 herself at the time. What did she get the Nobel Prize for? She got the Nobel Prize for demonstrating in plants the phenomenon of jumping genes. Remember what I said earlier on about whole domains of proteins that have shifted around, and therefore of the DNA, that have shifted around as you move from one species to another. That is the mechanism by which it happens. She wrote that in the future attention undoubtedly will be centered on the genome and with greater appreciation of its significance as a highly sensitive organ of the cell. You see, she got the, the idea which is the basic physiological idea that it is the cell, the tissue, the organs that transmit to the genome specific information telling it what to do. How else could it be that the 200 cells, types of cells in your body and mine, are all generated from exactly the same genome? It's because the genome is told to do something different in each case. He went on though, and responding to the changes, in the organism and the environment, often by restructuring the genome. She had the idea from her work on plants that ev eventually became clear from work in animals once we sequenced a number of genomes of various species. So, fourth conclusion is that cytoplasmic changes can be inherited. So what are the possible mechanisms? And I now come to the last of those articles that I referred to, which is this beautiful study um, by Richavi and his colleagues from Columbia University. What they did was to look at um, a virus that induces a viral silencing response in the little worm C. elegans. This, of course, is the um, species that Sidney Brenner um, popularized as a major target 
both of genomic work and of molecular biological work. So first of all, you induce the viral response, and that's done by the um, organism having the right DNA to make a particular RNA that silences uh, the virus. The interesting thing, first of all, is that the acquired silencing response is transgenerationally transmitted. The important point is that the transmission is non-Mendelian because what they did was very clever indeed. They crossed worms with that virally induced response with wild type that did not have the DNA for that response. And then, of course, in the next generation down, you'll get a mixture, but if you go on selecting down one or two generations, you eventually get to worms that don't have the DNA to make that viral-inducing response. What happens? They have acquired the characteristic. And the mechanism is also very clear. It is that RNA, as we saw also from some of those other experiments that I referred to earlier on, is transmitted down through the germline. And through RNA polymerase, you can, as it were, magnify it up in each generation. That inheritance is robust for a hundred generations. They followed the worms for a year. Um, there's the, the mechanism, but I don't have time to go through that. So my fifth conclusion is that environmentally induced changes can be inherited. I think the only question that remains now in relation to some of these major breaks with the neo-Darwinian synthesis or the modern synthesis is not whether they are broken as rules, but how often they are broken. So far, we have, as it were, a very modest collection of experiments that show the conditions under which those rules are broken. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, people thought that the experiments weren't worth doing. If you become so convinced that a particular theory is right, then you don't do the experiments to prove that it might be wrong. And also, the experiments are very difficult. I don't have time to go through that, but it takes quite a long time to do both behavioral studies, neurophysiological studies, and molecular biological studies, and genetic studies, which is what, of course, the Weaver work did um, that I referred to earlier. So, if gradual mutations is not the answer, what is responsible for re reorganization of genomes? And I finish this lecture by returning to Shapiro's book, Evolution of You from the 21st Century. He writes, contrary to traditional theories, it is now well documented that all prokaryotes and many eukaryotes acquire novel genomic segments and biochemical functions from other, often unrelated cells rather than exclusively by vertical inheritance from progenitors. In other words, the evolutionary tree of life is not really a tree. It's more like a network with exchange of genetic information, particularly in the prokaryotes, but as Shapiro emphasizes, we now know in eukaryotes too, uh, with horizontal transmission uh, of DNA occurring frequently between species. Um, <clears throat> there's also an important book uh, by Burton, Falk, and Reinberger that I'd recommend to those of you who want to catch up in this rapidly changing field, which is the concept of the gene in development and evolution. They write, it seems that a cell's enzymes are capable of actively manipulating DNA to do this or that. A genome, they write, consists largely of semi-stable genetic elements that may be rearranged or even moved around in the genome, thus modifying the information content of DNA. And remember, Barbara McClintock showed that 30 years ago. She worked on plants, and I suppose that people thought that it couldn't happen in animals. It does, too, and come to the final conclusion. And it's simply this. If functional changes in the adult can be inherited, and therefore a target for natural selection, then physiology, which is the analysis of function, is highly relevant to evolution. Not only in the process of selection, after the change, genetic change has occurred, but also conceivably, and we don't know yet, this is one of the big questions that still remains open, it seems to me, conceivably taking part in the process itself. Remember what I said earlier on, that frequency of mutations is environmentally um, dependent, is organism dependent.
Clearly, if it's possible for an organism to react, as it does with the immune system anyway, by increasing the frequency of genetic change in response to a, a demand from the environment or from the organism, perhaps the organism in response to the environment, then you have the glimmering of the uh, acquisition of acquired characteristics. So, finally, towards a new synthesis. Gene-centered view of natural selection, I think it's clear now that selection is multi-level and many evolutionary biologists would totally agree with that. That's not seriously, I think, in, in dispute anymore. Impossibility of inheritance of acquired characteristics, as we've seen, there are now examples of inheritance of acquired characteristics. The only question, it seems to me, is how frequently does this occur or is it a rare phenomenon? Distinction between replicator, genes and vehicle. I could never understand this anyway. What does replication mean? It means reproduction. The cell reproduces. It's not just the genome that reproduces. And indeed it can't be because, as I said earlier on, if you took the DNA out of a cell and put it in a petri dish and left it there with as many nutrients as you'd like, you could keep it for 10,000 years, it would do nothing. The genome replicates because the cell enables it to do so. So I would say that the genome, I would agree with Barbara McClintock here, is an organ of the cell, not its dictator, and control is distributed, not just in the genome. And as for the central dogma of molecular biology, um, genomes are not isolated from organism and environment. What went wrong there, I think, was, dare I say it in this way, some very distinguished molecular biologists, because goodness me, we're talking about Crick after all, went too far. What they actually showed was that protein sequences are not used as templates for DNA sequences. So far as we know, that is absolutely true. But that does not mean that information does not pass from the organism to the genome. After all, what are all those transcription factors doing? What determines the pattern of the transcription factors? What determines the pattern of, of epigenetic marking? It is, of course, the rest of the system. And I come to the last slide, a bit of further reading. Uh, those are the two articles that you may want to read if you want to uh, check on what I've said during this lecture. The article in the Journal of Physiology on Neo-Darwinism and the other one on Differential and Integral Views of Genetics in Interface Focus. And all of these can be downloaded free of charge by just simply going for what's called the Music of Life source book um, on the Music of Life website. And that's the end of my lecture. Thank you very much.